thank you very much and uh, good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. Um, I am going to be uh, giving a talk about open science. And um, I, my, the perspective of my talk is going to be really coming from someone who is actually doing research. So it's more like, I think it has a, a view from the trenches, so to speak. I also happens to have the, the honor and the pleasure of sitting on many evaluation boards throughout the Middle East in countries like Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, United Arab Emirates, uh, where I actually evaluate, and Jordan, I evaluate uh, promotion cases, I, I evaluate research, I evaluate. So I had a little bit of uh, a firsthand uh, connection to what is actually going on the ground. Uh, this is going to be in contrast with the high level talks that we had from the leaders this morning. And, um, you know, I can summarize my talk easily by saying, well, open science is good. So we can really uh, move on to the next lecture if you want. But uh, I'd like to also uh, really give a little bit of a more realistic assessment of what's going on. Um, the notion of reproducible research is actually something that goes back at least 300 years with the beginning of the uh, Industrial Revolution and the scientific method of Lord Kelvin. And we have had many, many stumbling blocks across the way since then. Some of you may remember the big scandals in the late 80s about cold fusion, for example. Some of you may remember the most recent scandal where somebody uh, claimed at, very early in the pandemic that they have found a, uh, a way to repurpose one of the medicines to solve or to cure uh, the uh, COVID virus. And to just tell you, to, to give you an idea about the damage that this has created, the president of the United States actually was informed of this research. And he proactively started promoting it, not knowing that the research itself was not reproducible. And the experts later on actually took uh, a lot of swipes against the people who actually perpetrated this, this lie. And so, uh, given, you know, the, the, the urgency of the pandemic and the uh, political rancor that is going on uh, in the United States and the rest of the world, it was really a sad contribution of the research community to the political process when we provide false information that could actually mislead the decision makers in this way. But I can also tell you that this is not new. Back in the 80s, there were even papers that were published about how to make reproducible research. Think of it like we were doing research on how to do research, okay? I'm giving you one example of a paper here. This is just one of many, many papers that were published during that era about how to really make it such that your experiment can be repeated by your colleagues in the research. And it was beyond, before the internet, before sharing of information, you know, it was, a, it was a, a very active and continues to be an active concern among scientists. Now, um, I come from computer science and the notion of open actually, I think originated in our field. In the late eighties, we had the open software foundation stating that any software that you use, you should have access to the source. This was followed by open systems and open MP, open GL, open this, open that. And then, you know, everybody started actually adopting this notion of openness. But I claim, and it's a claim that cannot be substantiated, is that a lot of this actually started with the revolution in information technology and the internet. And it has been really made facilitated by this particular uh, uh, technology, which is now really widespread all over the place, okay? Now, 
Back then, even in the 80s, in the 80s, researchers were actually sharing their information uh, by what we usually call self-archiving. Self-archiving is basically you put your data, you volunteer your data, and this has been going on since uh, the beginning of the 90s. And the, the, some of you may recognize a, a, a site called Archive. It's maintained by Cornell University. And it actually started by people who are in the area of physics. They started actually putting their papers on uh, that archive. And today it is actually becoming the de facto publication, not just in physics, but it is the publication forum in many, many fields. People go and, start and put their papers there just to really make sure that they have a stake in the ground. Now, you move forward to today and what is happening today? Well, in my field, uh, I heard a lot this morning about, we are going to do this, we are going to do that. Uh, if open science actually takes hold, well, I have news for you. Open science is already there. In my field, I can actually classify the conferences. And by the way, in computer science, we don't do journals. We do conferences because the field is moving very fast and you cannot wait for things to really show up in the journal. Conferences today either encourages you, they encourage you to really put all the information, data and everything, code, whatever, after they accept your paper, or they will encourage, encourage you to really submit everything with your paper or a small but fast growing section of conferences are mandating that you have to, sub to submit everything and it becomes part of the reviewing process. So people actually spend a lot of time reviewing your code, reviewing your methods and reviewing your data and making sure that they can reproduce the data before your paper is accepted. So open science is already there, it's happening. Okay, so this is good. Now there are some issues there. People in industry um, may not be able to participate in this. I spend quite a bit of time in my career in industry. And I can tell you that it's not going to be possible to share data and, and because a lot of these data might actually be proprietary and of, of great commercial nature. So open, open science still has some kinks to work out, but it is happening. And um, there is also an expense and overhead. And I will talk about this later, especially when it comes to the Middle East. I'm talking here, I'm giving you a, a global view and starting with the history because it's important to really uh, make the stage for what I'm gonna be talking about next. And then in 2013, no, before that even, I started uh, hearing about open access. Now I have to tell you this, open access is new. Open access had nothing to do with open science. Open science started 300 years ago and it was in action even before people started talking about open access. Now open access all of a sudden came into the, to, to, to the picture and today, if you go and ask any scientist and you tell them open access or open science, they will think you're talking about the same thing. In fact, if you go to the web page or you go Google and you say open science, the majority of the returns are really talking about open access, not open science. And there is a lot of confusion about this. Now, open access is good. I, as, as somebody who grew up in Egypt, I remember going to the library when I was 20 years old working on my master's. And I remember how difficult it was to really find what I was looking for. And sometimes it was not even available, all right? So I can appreciate open access and what it has done for the countries in the Middle East and elsewhere and making things you know, very accessible. And that has a lot of benefit. There is no doubt about that, okay? So uh, this is about the history. Uh, open access actually started taking the moniker of open access, I think with the Budapest uh, initiative or manifesto 
Uh, but actually, a lot of people were really doing the, tra the, the tenets of open access even before that. And, uh, excuse me, <laughs> um, today I can tell you that the majority, if not all, the publishers have really switched. And today it's a government mandate, for example, in countries like the United States and the ERC in Europe, that all the research that is funded by, by taxpayer money, it has to be open. Now, there are criteria there that are still ambiguous and all of that stuff, but the trend is there and the train has left the station. We, we are now in the era of open access and, 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 and open research and publishers loved it. At the beginning, publishers actually were resisting it. I was actually involved in discussions with the IEEE. The IEEE is one of the biggest organization in engineering, and I'm a member there. Uh, and I was, I was involved in many discussions about that and how the IEEE was afraid of losing the uh, subscription fees, which really operated their publishing unit. And they were very scared of that. But now everybody's doing it. So as it turns out, there is also a bad side for open access. The problem that I have with open access is not the concept of itself because I can appreciate how important it is for researchers to obtain what they need and to obtain it quickly. And nicely, you know, if it is free, that would be beautiful. What I don't like about open access is the business model that actually came about. Imagine that if you are going to the grocery stores and people are gonna tell you, you can pick whatever you want because the sellers have paid for the merchandise. Okay, think about that. I bet you're not gonna find a whole lot of good quality stuff. If the sellers actually paid for it, it's probably, some of it is gonna be good, some of it's gonna be bad. And now your problem is not really being able to find what you're looking for. It's to really search and find what is worth looking for. And that's a big problem with the explosion of papers that are coming. I actually feel very bad about the graduate students today who are really doing the research because during my time when I was doing my PhD, I actually read every paper in my field. It was feasible back then. And you could actually have five, uh, six forums. You read these papers, you know everything that is going on. Today, simply it's not possible. It's just impossible. Lots and lots of, of, of publications and people who are doing research today often do not really know about what has been going on. And there is a lot of reinvention of the wheel because of that. Now, um, the, the situation was back in when, when we started moving into electronic forums, the, the, the cost for publications and shipping was beginning to really escalate and publishers were really under a lot of pressure. And open access actually with the new business model is in a certain way, a publisher savior, because now you are adopting a model of pay to publish rather than I'm gonna provide you with something that I hope is of high quality that you are willing to pay money or your library is willing to pay money for us to be able to uh, provide it for you. So um, it's also interesting to see that some of the biggest players in this area are Wall Street private equity uh, 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 firms, which are not known for altruistic uh, behavior. Uh, most of these companies, most of these firms are there to really make a lot of profit. And I was actually surprised when I saw Clarivet and I saw Scopus and all of that kind of stuff. All of that actually, these are all are owned by private equity firm. Something to really think about. Okay. So, I'm, this is really an email that I got right after the email that Emily sent me 
to, to remind me again of submit your presentation now or else. Okay. And I got this. I, the XXX is, I, I removed that because I didn't want to uh, be sued or put anybody in shame. But this is what I got. They are inviting me to submit my exquisite papers, whatever they are saying there. They are providing a waiver, 20%. And I submitted by October 30th, it shows up on November 1st. Now you tell me what kind of peer review is that? All right? Wonderful, right? Because in my field, if I actually send the paper to the ACM or the IEEE, I am going to wait for three years until it shows up. By that time, the paper is irrelevant. This is why we have conferences, all right? Now, these guys have solved my problem, didn't they? Wonderful stuff. And by the way, I find out that this is not a journal in computer science. This is a journal in, in uh, I think, what, what was it? Uh, practical medicine or something like that. All right, I, I get invited to submit papers in biology, submit papers in medical science. I have no idea why they think I know these things, okay? This, I am not unique. The researchers throughout the Middle East are bombarded with garbage like this. All right, so we have the flood. Before open access, journals had to survive on quality. If they didn't publish quality stuff, the people would not renew their subscriptions, the journal goes out of business. That's not the case anymore. We have pay for publish, and we have a situation, especially here in the Middle East, where this actually is having a corrosive effect. Now, maybe I should not worry about it. All of these journals, the majority of these journals are what I call write-only journals. Nobody reads them. They are just there so that you could put on your resume that you have published something. And there are pressures that universities, governments, funding agencies actually place on the researchers so that they could actually say, oh yeah, here, look at my citations. Oh yeah, look how many papers I published. I will, I will, I will talk about this very quickly. Now, this talk is about what's going on in the Middle East. So let me tell you a little bit about that. Again, I am not against open access. I'm against the business model. Open access is crucial for enabling people in the Middle East to really be able to have access to the latest research. So I need to be very careful here because I have open science, that's something. I have open access, there is something, and I have the business model of open access, which is really what I think is causing problems here. So, the first thing is the cost. The average cost is, I did a quick search, and I found that the average goes around $2,000. It goes up to $4,000 some places, it goes to maybe $1,000 in some places. And then there are those who can actually publish your paper for $50, all right? And they don't have any problem with that. They are, you know, their, their mission in life is to enable poor people who are doing research to publish their stuff. Unfortunately, they don't really have peer review at the way it's, it's supposed to be. Now, here's the problem. We have waivers. These, all of the open access, they would say, oh, uh, the poor countries in the Middle East, and by the way, the majority of people in the Middle East live in what the World Bank calls tier three and tier four countries. It's a polite way of saying poor and very poor, all right? Uh, only the Gulf states are in tier one and tier two, and they are not included in this discussion. I work in, the, in, I work in Saudi Arabia. We do not have a problem with open access even put up with the business model. That's not a problem. But I see people in Jordan. I see people in Egypt. I see people in Morocco. They are suffering from this. $2,000. I mean, a lot of people here are from this country and from, the, from neighboring country. You know what $2,000 compared to the salaries? If you are running a university here, you know that $2,000 is a lot of money here. Okay? And a 50% discount is not going to cut. 
That's still $1,000. That's a lot of money here, okay? And um, you are going to get invitations. Oh, you don't have to publish in the $2,000. We have this journal that nobody has heard about and nobody reads, but you can actually publish something and we're just gonna cost you $59, $69. And if you cannot, we can give you 20%. And it doesn't matter if it is your field or not. You know, we just want you to really add your resume. All right, where is this coming from? There was a discussion earlier this morning, one of the gentlemen, the gentleman from the UNESCO, he mentioned something about, oh, we are ranking very poorly in innovation and uh, Scopus is, is showing us really badly. Well, yeah, correct. And you know what? Because we have chosen these criteria to evaluate ourselves and we're doing it to ourselves. Now there is a very famous word here that I heard in the United States very early on, where manufacturing is, research follows. Okay, so you do not really, things did not start by people really establishing a research lab and then discovering the, uh, you know, the, how to send people to the moon. That's not how it works. There is, you need to have an ecosystem and it's R and D, not just R, there is D. And D in the United States takes maybe 80% of the R and D because D is extremely important to really create the, the, the cadres and the people who are going to be able to articulate what the problems are so that the researchers could work, could work on them. I often say in research, it's more important to really pick the problem rather than to find the solution. And this is really where the problem here is. Okay. And one of the problems that we have in the Middle East is that we do not link our research to what the society needs. So you have, you want to really be doing good research, you're going to have to have manufacturing, you're going to have to have agriculture. And that's really when you start linking the research to these things. It's not the other way around. Okay. Um, and open science, of course, in the Middle East is going to require a lot of infrastructure. So anyway, um, I'm, worried, I'm, I'm, I'm worried that we are creating and perpetrating what I would call a caste system. There will be the poor researchers and the and, uh, and, the, and the rich researchers. This is a big problem and the Middle East might be condemned or at least the majority of the countries in the Middle East may be condemned into the lower caste because of, of this stuff. Okay, so suggestions. Um, what should we do? Well, you, we can actually, there, there are no actually active publishers in the Middle East that actually have international reputation. And this is something we need to work on. You need to really have what I would say, community-based working on open access, make open access work for everybody by having true, honest to God, peer review systems. And this could be run by the, by the community. We don't need all this business stuff and we don't need all these predatory journals that are, are inviting me to publish in biology. Uh, we need to set evaluation criteria that matters for the Middle East. Do not imitate what's going on in the United States. The gap is too far. We are not there yet to really, you know, worry about Scopus. And, and I, I served in, 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 in national award committees where people are saying, you know, how many citations? And I said, you, how many citations? Walk five kilometers there. You are going to find people who don't give a damn about citations. They cannot even find food for tomorrow. So link your research to the problems that are genuine to the to the nation so that the research becomes meaningful. Finally, collaborations. I am amazed. I've been 10 years in Saudi Arabia, try to establish tons of relationships with local and regional universities. It's been an exercise in frustration. You know, I started with Zuel University, nothing happened. Uh, you know, I can actually go with names. It's not the point. Emily is gonna kill me now. So let me finish by stating that we have a lot of things that we need to do in order to really make the research and the evaluation to really matter. And then once this actually is done, open access and open science will become beautiful tools that are going to enable uh, the, the fruits of this research actually to benefit both the research community and the population that are paying for it. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Raid Al-Zuhli, library director at Jordan University of Science and Technology. 
and my presentation today will be toward a fair compliant commerce in the ASRA region, and I will be also highlighting the USC ASRA in partnership. My presentation will be four parts. First, I will be talking about the fair concept, then I will be highlighting ASRA strategy on open science, then briefly talk about USC. After that, I will be highlighting the USC ASRA in partnership. What fear takes us to the year 2016, when Professor Mark Wilkinson and his team published an article in the Journal of Scientific Data about the fear guiding principles. Before that, of course, there were other publications about the principles and guidelines. And it's very important to mention that the G8 Science Minister statement in the year 2013 addressed the need of fair features, actually. They addressed the need to have discoverable, accessible, accessible, intelligible, reusable, and to maintain a quality of standards. The definition of fair goes to the guiding principles uh, that uh, need to be findable, that is by assigning globally unique BIDs based on the desire to metadata to get them rich, registered, and indexed. And to be accessible, these metadata need to be retrievable by their identifiers using a standardized protocol, which is freely and open and universally implementable, uh, allows authentication, authorization whenever needed. Continue with definition to be interoperable by using a formal accessible shared language that meets the fair principles with a qualified reference, and to be reusable by having a richly described relevant attributes, have a clear and accessible data usage license, and of course, to meet the domain relevant community standards. Very important to differentiate between fair and open data. Data can be fair or open, both or neither. And of course, being fair and open will have the greatest benefits for researchers and research communities. The realization of fair uh, needs the following essential components. We need to have a policies, data management plans, identifiers, standards, and of course, data repositories. I come to the second part of my presentation about the ASRIN strategy on open science and how this strategy will support fair compliance common in the region. It stands for the Arab States Research and Educational Network, which is a non-profit international organization registered under the umbrella of the League of Arab States. Uh, it's actually an association of Arab region national research and educational networks, and then aims to implement, manage, and extend e-infrastructure dedicated for research and education, both scientific research, uh, uh, the main goal is to connect Arab institutions among themselves and the globe through high-speed data communication networks and, of course, to promote scientific research, innovation, and education across the Arab region. One component of the ASRIN strategy is the Lipsense Initiatives, initiative launched in 2016. The aim is to bring collaboration between uh, regional research and education network and academic libraries. There are outcomes so far for this initiative. There have been terms of reference for NREL library collaboration. There have been metadata guidelines. There are plans for regional and repository hosting services and national and institutional policy templates. ASRIN contributes to the LibSense initiative and through a series of different workshops. Um, and always uh, there is uh, priorities about the need of federated discovery system for the region, increasing the value of the Arabic content, having a shared content hosting platforms, uh, working on advocacy, training, and communication practices. Uh, there are uh, continuous promotion of the open science access trend and the practices through ASRIN mailing list and discussion groups. There are always 
contributions and builds on Belpsen's work groups, mainly the infrastructure work group related to open access journals, repositories, and discovery services, the co-designing open access publishing infrastructure, the capacity building and policies work group. Participation in international events and conferences is uh, another item in the strategy. Uh, it's worth mentioning that Asrin participated in an event in the 16th International Conference on Open Repositories uh, with an event titled Brokerage Event towards Fair Compliant Commons in the Asrin region. This was a three hours event, was divided into three bars, workshop, brokerage session, and hands on tutorial. Uh, participants were from different countries, from Italy, from Palestine, from Jordan, Somalia, Qatar, Morocco, Saudi Arabia, and Ethiopia. To support strategy on open science, there is a collaboration with BID's providers such as DataSight and ORCID. There are continuous technical awareness sessions and training. There are Continuous discussions with these providers, the aim of discussions uh, to enable ASRIN or NREN to be BID's providers, enablers in their countries. Uh, there is so far a signed MOU between ORCID and ASRIN to facilitate the adoption of ORCID IDs to, and to use ORCID's registry among the members of ASRIN community. Availing federated discovery systems in the region is one of the top priorities. So the collaboration between ASRIN and the references, an example of ASRIN's strategy on open science, La Francia is a Latin American network of open access repositories. It's a kind of federated network of institutional repositories. The aim of collaboration is to advance open science policies, services, and infrastructure. Uh, soon, ASRIN will start to adopt the contribute to the reference setup, internationalization, access based on open source software. Element on the open science strategies, the collaboration with the UNESCO, there is a contribution to the UNESCO recommendation on open science, and the areas of collaboration has been highlighted through the developing of national roadmaps, uh, initiating the Arab states open science cloud, and policy development workshops. Another item in the strategy is the collaboration with the Association of Arab Universities, the area of collaboration in supporting research and education infrastructure. There have been an MU signed to support the network to connect universities and research centers. Uh, collaboration in the sharing knowledge and collaboration and cooperation in open science and open access. A similar collaboration recently started with the Federation of Arab Scientific Research Council. There have been an MU sign and collaboration to be in all relevant infrastructures and in tools and applications of scientific research. Now I come to the third part of my presentation about AISC. ESC stands for the European Open Science Cloud. ESC is simply a web of scientific insight where they, where they will provide a web of fair data and related services, federation of future data sources, virtual space, open ended range of content and services. And of course, they will be meeting all European data requirements and will be in interaction with other regions in the world. These are a list of important requirements for ISC to deliver. They will deliver relevant data, sufficiency rich metadata, search mechanism, software, computer power, usually available in the cloud, storage usually available in the cloud, access, automatic references, and other. ISC Association has so far 163 members and 78 observers. ESC Brain Bulls is into 13 task forces, five advisory groups, part of them for implementation of ESC, technical challenges in ESC, metadata and data quality. This is includes semantic interoperability, fair metrics and data quality, research, 
careers and curricula and sustaining years. I will briefly highlight the partnership between ESC and ASRM. ASRM became observer member at ESC Association in March 2021. The snapshot is from the ESC Association website where you can find ASRM listed there as an observer. ASRM participate in ESC technical and official meetings. Also, ASRM participate in ESC General Assembly meetings. They were online meetings and Recently, there was a face-to-face -face General Assembly meeting in May 2022. This is an example about uh, ASRIN enrollment in EUSC activities. ASRIN team started to participate in EUSC advisory group task forces. We have participation and uh, full enrollment in fair metrics and data quality task force. This task force to think that's shared by Professor Mark Wilkinson, as you remember, he is the first who initiated the concept of FAIR. The ultimate goal of this collaboration is that as is counting on this collaboration to initiate an Arabian Open Science Cloud setup. By this, I come to the end of my presentation. Thank you so much. I will be ready for your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Egypt's vision towards open research and science, it's a content analysis study for published information sources. This is the main title for our presentation today. Thanks a lot for my, my distinguished colleagues and many thanks for the organizers. I thought that I'm going to meet them today. Yeah, the majority, okay, they are here. Thank you very much. I have five elements I'm going to talk up in a few minutes, not more than 20. I think that I have to pass the introduction, which is a theoretical base. I'm sure that you hear it a lot from all colleagues from the other presentations. And then go forward to Egypt's vision towards open research science. It's a content analysis study for the web information sources available for all people all over the world. And the second element is about a content analysis study, but for other uh, previous researchers, uh, researches I did, and the fourth point is about the new one regarding the published formal information sources, what was available to me as a researcher, and then conclusions and some suggestions. From the first beginning, I was thinking that I have to start with the Egypt's vision 2030, and then any published materials by the Minister's Council and the Egyptian Higher Supreme for Universities, Ministry of Higher Education and Scientific Research, other related institutional researches, and UNESCO website. The research follows UNESCO's definition and initiatives for open research and science, trying to find any mentions in the sources, the formal sources I have analyzed in this presentation, making science more accessible, inclusive, and equitable for the benefit of all, making science for all. I think it's much short and give them the same meaning. OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, give us uh, a definition for open science, as well as some stages or some uh, steps to follow. And then the definitions, and I'm sure that I'm not going to repeat them again for the open science, open scientific uh, uh, information, scientific publications, research data, which I'm interested actually personally, and I have two or three uh, theses for masters. I'm supervising them about research data management in some uh, universities in Egypt and uh, abroad. Education resources, our open, open education resources, what we did during COVID at least. Open source software and source code, 
We are, uh, as librarians, we depend on Koha, for example, it's an open source, but now there is Folio, much updated, much integrated, and much advanced. Open hardware. What about the information available for all concerning Egypt's vision towards open research and science? I started with UNESCO, Global Open Science Partnership, and I found that we have only two partners. The Association of Arab Universities, the new Library of Alexandria of Biblioteca Alexandrina. And we have here two representatives, Dina and Rania. We are expecting a distinguished role in this area by the UNESCO Cairo office, inshallah. Also, I checked the UNESCO Global Open Science Partnership, the UNESCO Arab Science Podium, developed by UNESCO Cairo office. I'm crossing my fingers for everything should be successful. We can found any achievement concerning uh, the open science and open research in the area in the Arab region. I checked Duar, Director of Open Access Repository. I found only eight private universities plus the new library of Alexandria. But I can remember that I, we have more than 56 universities in Egypt and more than 400 research centers. What are they are doing concerning institutional repositories? I checked Director of Open Access Journals. I found 69. Although the ISSN website says that Egypt has more than 100 up to 1,000 serial numbers for journals and other continuing education, continuing uh, publications. Road Director of Open Access Scholarly Resources, we are absent. What about the archived continuing resources also absent? The file does not exist. What about the open research data, number of data repositories by country? But here is the specialized in research data repositories do not exist. And I think that that's why we are using confidential, secret, and top secret. Although research data should be available for all. When I searched the data, data repositories by countries, I found just one repository in Egypt, but it is not available. URL is not available. It belongs as far as I can remember to the Information and Decision Support Center. Open access policies worldwide. Do we have a policy seen published for open accessibility to knowledge? Also, I found that we are not here. We are absent. What about the published researches that I did maybe this year or the year before? About a map of research data in Egypt, but this is in Arabic. I'm going to make it in English now. I found that we have a good achievements. We, have, we, need, we need policies, but we need policies to be applied and also known by researchers, not only in universities, but all research centers in Egypt. I divided this ecosystem in four sections, the national plans, strategies, visions, policies, and the second for institutions, organizations, systems, and networks, and the persons, students, researchers, or individuals, researchers, educators, Information sources publication is the end product that can be uh, measured by the databases, bibliometrics, altimetrics, whether in Scobus or Clarivate Analytics Web of Science. The overlap of the components of the scientific research system or scientific research ecosystem, we have obsolescence, we have overlap, we have incompatibility, we have something, many things not clear. We, we are. The second research I did yes, uh, last year, it was in 2021 in Galala University, presented to the regional forum, the first regional forum for open science for Arab countries of Arab world. It was based on comparison of the first 10, top 10 universities all over the world compared with the top 10 universities in the Arab world. 
what these did compared by the open access to knowledge initiatives, what their libraries doing, are they a hub for open access to knowledge universities? No initiatives. I found uh, which, which university ranking I, I choose the top 10, it was Webometrics, the Spanish one. I found that about 80% of the initiatives concerning uh, uh, libraries at the hub for open access to knowledge, they are already available in the top 10 universities all over the world, starting by Harvard, Stanford, Massachusetts, California, Berkeley, and the rest. What about the Arabic? What is the situation in the Arab universities? Only 17% are available. That means that we need our academic librarians to work better, to work more, but under the supervision or of all the university chairmen and the uh, postgraduate and uh, postgraduate research uh, Maybe you'll find something repeated like Open Science Framework or Open Science Framework OSF. I mentioned the same names, the same titles I found in the websites, but I put them together. What about the new one? What do you find in the new published formal information sources? Let me start with our pyramid. It is not only bank, it's a pyramid. Yes, we have a, a Egyptian knowledge bank. It's free, it's open access for all citizens, all people who has an ID, identification number. It's a pyramid because it's, the base is global, global full text aggreg aggregated databases. Yes, we have EBSCO, Wiley, Emerald, whatever. And then we have regional Arabic. Content, full text aggregated databases like Al Manduma or Baikan, and many others will come, inshallah. And the national content, full text and content databases. And that's why I called it a pyramid, not a bank, but it's a bank. It's a good job. It's open access to online scientific journals, ebooks, and encyclopedias for everybody in the whole country. I think it's the first nationwide license for these uh, publishers. Another great job we had in Egypt is the Spranger Nature with STDF. That we have this agreement, open access agreement for Egypt, a guide for corresponding authors. Another great job, another great achievement, I feel proud when I talk about it, is the Arabic Citation Index. It's a, a cooperation between Egyptian knowledge pyramid or bank with Clarivate Analytics Web of Science. This first local language citation index for the Arabic region. And now it's free for journalists to register the Arabic journal. I analyzed the national strategy for science 2030 for science, technology, and innovation. And I found some remarks concerning the research ecosystem, like very good rank in international publishing, low rank in innovation indicator, plagiarism issue, no clear research priorities. Concerning plagiarism issue, there is a national committee for a plagiarism for Arabic publications or Arabic literature. And they have a meeting at the same time with this session at two. No clear research pri pri priorities, poor quality scholarly publishing for institutions, rare scholarly publishing international journals in humanities and social sciences. We have something, but we are asking God to be applied, is 1% budget allocation from the national income to support scientific research in Egypt. And this is mentioned clearly in our constitution. Egypt's vision 2030, it's available for all people to read and, uh, about it. Main pillars are the economic, environmental, and the social pillar. Where are we? We are in the social uh, pillar, education and innovation, knowledge, and scientific research. It's very clear. 
and there is a good vision, a creative and innovative society producing science, technology, and knowledge within a comprehensive system, ensuring the development value of knowledge and innovation using their outputs to face challenges and meet national objectives. We are proud to have this institution, we have this body, STDF. They are trying to improve the research and development in environment. As we mentioned before, they have an agreement with Springer Nature to, uh, for online, for open publishing. They are paying instead of the publishers, instead of the researchers. Support complete cycle of scientific research and product development, disseminates information on science and technology in Egypt. What our conclusion and suggestions? Egypt 2030 covered innovation, yeah, knowledge, scientific research. This TD, STDF disseminates information on science and technology in Egypt. But we have to assure that libraries are the hub for open knowledge initiatives. Libraries play a vital role in free publishing through freely available and accessible scholarly journals like Doaj or be a member of the worldwide digital institution repositories for research like Dwar, providing free access to masters and doctoral thesis through ATD electronic theses and dissertations repositories and fighting for this Maximizing the benefit of educational resources available for free of charge, open education resources or OER, develop a national policy of Egypt. We need this policy for open science practices, spreading the culture of research data management, but because until now, we are afraid to tell other colleagues about what we are researching, what's our research problem. We are uh, uh, afraid of this. School of Libraries, which I am I'm, uh, I'm one of the staff in the Department of Library and Information Science in uh, Cairo University, they have to recheck their uh, programs to, to assure that library specialists or librarians or information specialists, they have the new vision. What's the new vision is open library. Open library doesn't equal or doesn't mean open doors and they are available to public, but rather to get rid of buildings and the storage spaces and replace them with information resources available on the web, either through the platforms of publishers, suppliers, or through the university library platform. And we have EKB, Egyptian Knowledge, uh, Egyptian Knowledge Bank or Egyptian Knowledge Pyramid. Betting on modern academic research librarians who keep us with developments of open science, I think we can do something tangible in open science and open research. Otherwise, it would be just words and policies and strategies, and no one knows what they are doing. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity again, and we wish to find something in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I have the pleasure of presenting just before a coffee break. So I need coffee. I'm sure you need coffee as well. And today we've been hearing a lot of problems. We've been hearing a lot of issues that we need, a lot of lack of funding, lack of policies, lack of everything. So who here still likes open science? Show of hands. <laughs> okay, that's <not> now. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, I hope that people are still encouraged to do open science. And I think there's a lot of potential in the region. And we've been focusing on a lot of issues. So I do hope that in my presentation, what I'm gonna be talking about today is that in Qatar National Library, we had an idea like five years ago to do something. And I'm gonna show how we did it with limited resources. And this limited, let's say human resources and limited policies and et cetera. So <clears throat> this is the library. Um, I do hope that many of you uh, have a chance to visit in the future. Um, and in this presentation, I'll be talking about what are we doing, which problems are we trying to address, and what is still needed. So a bit of about Qatar National Library. 
So our mission is to preserve the nation and region's heritage and enable the people of Qatar to positively influence society by creating an exceptional environment for learning and discovery. And as a, as a national library, we have a very um, <clears throat> special role. We are a national library, but we're also a heritage library, a research library, and a public library. And we are trying to serve different segments of Qatar society. We had this question a couple of years ago. How can we maximize the use of Qatar's research outputs? And to explain this a bit, <clears throat> I want to talk about the problem about the electronic resource subscriptions. So if you imagine this rectangle here represents one publisher in which all this content is up for a subscription. A library would then pay an annual fee to have access to this content, like that. So when you're paying a subscription, you have access. But the problem is, well, at least from our perspective, is that some of this research published by the publisher is from Qatar-based researchers. And as long as we have a subscription, we have access to it. But as soon as we have an inactive subscription, we lose a lot of this access. Now, in many publishers, they would give you perpetual access, which is great, but we are very dependent on publisher subscriptions. And we thought that open access or being open is a solution. The idea there is that we try as much as we can to publish or support the publication of open access content. And by open, I don't mean just simply free, right? So it's free to use, right? That's one of the things that it needs to be done. But it can also be modified, can be reused, and it could be shared with anyone for any purpose. This is what we want to open to be. <clears throat> so this is also a picture of the National Library from inside. And I'm usually here with the photography section. But what I want to do is talk about now the, the open access program. And the program, at least when it started in 2015, was the idea is to cover the publishing costs for Qatar-based researchers. We heard today about the rising costs of APCs, and no author should pay that from their own pocket. But it happens. Many researchers still want to publish open access, either by pressure or they think it's fast or whatever the reason is, and they have to take money from out of their own pocket. Even 1,000, 2,000, 500 is still a lot, especially if you look into multiple publications a year. So our goal is to cover this cost, to, so not to have any author pay from their own pocket. The other goal is to create and contribute to a permanent archive of Qatar-based research in Kionala. We heard about copyright today, right? So open access is openly licensed and allows us to make copies of this content, put in a repository forever. <clears throat> now, the question again is why to have a fund? So many Qatar researchers or Qatar-based researchers, um, and I just mentioned this is based to anybody working in Qatar, regardless of nationality. If they want to publish their article, they don't have institutional uh, support. And of course, the choice to publish open access is dependent on funds. There's a lack of institutional support in the sense of policies, and kind of mandates, as we heard today from different uh, speakers. And even if the, like some, so many of the research have research grants from the Qatar National Research Fund, but it's not enough in many cases to publish open access. Or in many cases, they publish the articles once the research is over and they don't have access to the funds. And to benefit from this, the, the researchers need to be uh, a Qatar-based researcher. They should have exhausted all other funds and they need to meet certain criteria. So we're very thankful for the DOHA because we're very dependent on the DOHA as the setting uh, of the criteria of quality. <clears throat> I'll come back to DOHA. Sorry, sorry, but the camera is. <laughs> um, can't put it off. Anyways, this shows the number of articles that we funded over the last uh, five years. Now, I said we started this in 2015. We didn't really have a structured service until 2018. And there's a reason why to do that. But you can see there's an increase in the number of um, articles approved. Um, it's about 3,000 so far from 1,400 authors 
from 33 different institutions, an average of two articles per author. And the way we do this is we use uh, read and publish agreements, which um, basically what we decided is that we're never, well, never, we won't sign any agreement for subscription as long, unless there is a publishing element to it. And we started this policy in 2018, and we've been, uh, follow, we've been following through with this policy. So we've signed the first read and publish agreements with major publishers such as uh, Elsevier, Spring Nature, Taylor Francis, IEEE, Wiley, et cetera, et cetera. We also have uh, agreements with fully open access publishers because we believe in supporting different business models, not only one singular model. And in case that we don't have any of the agreements, we still would support the publication of a journal if it's listed in DOAJ, and we do it through different means such as payment through a credit card. <clears throat> now I'm gonna talk about the issues. So um, as you can see, there's a rise in the funding requests uh, over time. We have a bit of a dip in 2022 is because of some of the agreements are um, renewed or not renewed or have been delayed in renewal. But there are so many different complexities. So we work with 15 different publisher agreements. We work with 50 different publishers. We have different payment methods. We have the introduction of taxes in 2020 and how to deal with it. Uh, we have requests for non-DOAJ journals. We would, some people want books, some people want journals, some people want book chapters, um, and different licenses. So now I'm not talking about just CCBY versus CCBY and C, but some publishers, their version of a CCBY and C is not really what we want. Because if you read the fine print, it's not really done in the open access spirit. Um, but that's something, another topic for another day. But what we have issues with are different workflows. Workflows, 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 right? So some publishers have systems to track requests. Others use email. Others allow us to include an article as part of the agreement in peer review. Others will only do it after the article is accepted. Some would allow us to change the license or request to change the license from a CCBY and CND to a CCBY. Others won't even do it. And then like others would include it, like allow us to include the article in the agreement after publications and others uh, would only do it before. Some are flexible, others are not. So in 2018, now we've run the service as an ad hoc thing. We get a request, we do it, and we thought we need to be better organized. Now we asked the question, how to run a new service with limited human resources? There was only like myself and my colleague, Milan, in the office, and we're thinking, how can we do it? There's only two of us. Do we need to get HR on board to get more people? Do we need to get hiring more people? And we thought, no, let's try to think about, because if we do it, we'll probably be here today and talking about the same problems <laughs> we did five, five years ago. We've hired uh, one contractor and we tried to think out, let's say, how can we do it in a more agile way? Now, when I talk about agile, it's a way of, let's say an, uh, an approach in management that is iterative, that is very quick and it's very kind of, uh, you can make decisions quickly and come up with results um, very quickly and efficiently. <clears throat> so one of the things that we did is we had a Kanban board, something similar to this. We had the list of things that we needed to do, the things that are in progress, um, the things that are being kind of needed approval and the things that are being done. And with being agile, it's a way of improving communication between the team and improving kind of how we get things done very quickly. So we also had a daily stand-up meeting. So for five minutes, every morning at 8.30, we meet at like the meeting room, the three of us, and we talk about three things. And the meeting will be five minutes. What have you done yesterday? What do you plan to do today? Are there any issues? So then we have a daily cycle of issue resolving. So the next like by 24 hours, by 8.30 the next day, we should have at least attempted to resolve the issues that we had identified. And because of the workflows, we have everything documented in a week. So uh, the, one of the goals is to do an immediate uh, workflow uh, update. Quick problem solving as daily cycles. And we do these sprints, which basically mean that we identify a set of, kind of um, results that we need to get in, in an X amount of days and or a day or two when we work on that uh, primarily and try to get it done. 
the goal is to build a team. So yeah, you can do whatever you, need, you can do if you have a strong team, a strong understanding, a strong communication between the team members. And that's what we focused on. And just an example, like, um, like when, I, when we do the, the, the Kanban board, it goes from backlog to do to in progress to awaiting reply to being resolved. And this is an example of how we realized that um, after having this kind of uh, technique, most of our requests are stuck in awaiting reply. And we did an analysis and we figured out that we are sending an email. So anybody, so anytime somebody requests a, a publication request, we send them an eligibility email. We ask them to reply within a day or two and they never do. So we then ask them for a reminder and a reminder and then the whole process takes three weeks. And we realized that we can just kind of remove the whole thing and we can just get an immediate approval in as soon as we get the email. So this is kind of a way of using the techniques. We're using existing tools online. You don't actually have to buy anything. You can get, these tools are free. You can implement them and can get, get the results. Now, yeah, I talked about some of the good things. Now I'll talk about some challenges. So when it comes to publishing workflows, we still need kind of community sharing of workflows and best practices. We are implementing what we know because we've talked with others. So I think talking with different parties, different institutions is really helpful. But publishers, <laughs> they need to also come and think of better ways of doing uh, workflows. Alternative communication systems, I think in this conference we'll hear from OA switchboard that I believe there's Kronos Hub, uh, somebody from Kronos Hub also sp uh, speaking, and easier payment methods. Now, finally, I wanna talk about something related to the theme of this panel. To be open, we need multiple solutions. I've talked what we did in the Qatar National Library, but we're not doing it alone. We're doing this as part of a consortium of different libraries in Qatar. There's about 10 of us, so we're working together. We're negotiating together with publishers. We're getting to, um, we have a shared understanding of what we want to do. So the idea, for example, the first thing is leveraging costs or shifting costs from subscription only to publishing. And we were able to do it. Some publishers rejected our request when we did it in 2018, but now we have it. So it's a matter of asking and pushing for what you want. You really need to know what you want before just asking for it. And yeah, so basically we believe in some principles. So I think when we talk today about issues, we talked about challenges, you need to think about the principles. What do you want to achieve for being open? Is to uh, have higher impact or have uh, content that can be reused. If you identify these issues, then you can actually come up with solutions. And it doesn't have to be the most expensive solution or even an expensive solution, you can do it. Now, again, gold open access isn't the best, or not the best way, it's not the only way of doing open access. So we're uh, launching Manara, which is uh, in, 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 in English means lighthouse. And it's a research repository and we're hoping to do some kind of uh, preprints and self-archiving to allow for all more open access uh, models. And we're doing this together with uh, Digital Science and Fixture. So I'm sure they're here in the room. Finally, I wanna talk about SCOS, which is the Global Sustainability Coalition for Open Science Services. So Qatar National Library, and I was really happy to see this today and also like they've read our name as part of the group. So we are part of SCOS and we are on the board of SCOS. Um, we sit on the board. Um, so SCOS is the Global Sustainability Coalition for Open Science Services. And the idea here is that there are so many different open infrastructure out there that are run independently, they are non-commercial, but they're running because they, are, they need the support of the community. And there's a risk of, you know, like if they don't have enough funding that they can downsize, they, or they can ask for money, or where worst case scenario, they even are bought by a publisher who will make it even more expensive. So the goal of SCOS is to help sustain the infrastructure to support the implementation of open science. And it's community-led, and what SCOS does, it receives, basically, it sets the different open infrastructure out there and tells the community which are important and which needs funding. And there have been three cycles, so Sherpa Romeo, which as a copyright librarian, I'm very highly dependent on, but there's DOAJ, and I mentioned DOAJ several times today. It's very important, and through SCOS, 
DOAJ was the first kind of to get uh, its funding target. There've been three cycles. So the second cycle has DOAB and open, open citations and PKP. The third funding cycle has archive, Redelic, Amelica, and DSpace. And we've seen open, I think the statistics from open door of all different Arabic countries. So I ask you to go in and check which repositories that all these institutions are using. And most of them are using DSpace. So as a community, as a region, we're using this, these open infrastructure and we need to support them. <laughs> and we need to support them more because if we don't, then yeah, we, we don't want to think about our future. The open infrastructure exists and is free for most of us, but also requires some support from the community. So I ask you to check out SCOS and as from your institutions think of contributing. And it could be as low as $500 a year, but that $500 from one institution combined with other institutions can get us a lot uh, on the long run. I'll stop with this question here is then, we've talked about open science, open access and open publications and et cetera. The goal is that everything, it becomes open. And the question is right now, I'm, I want you to think, I want you to imagine, what if all of us, all institutions, whether we're government, non-government, private, commercial, non-commercial libraries, et cetera, can have access to all the research content in the world? How would that look like? And that, that's something that we need to think and imagine. And I've struggled myself to think of, I kind of come up with that image in my head. So for fun kind of exercise, I've asked um, Midjourney. I'm not sure if um, you've used Midjourney, but it's an AI tool that you give an input and it gives you an image based on that question. So I've put this question and this is how the world would look like if, or at least the library would look like if it had all the content in the world. So maybe this is something that we can have in our mind to think this is our goal. Um, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and this is my email address, and thank you. So, first of all, any questions from the room? Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, this is Abdullah Mutwali, professor at Cairo University, and I would like to thank all the uh, speakers here. My uh, question, actually, it's just a reflection and uh, it just directed to Professor Dr. Sharif Shaheen. I would like to thank you about this uncovering presentation that I think uh, was very transparent regarding the situation for the Arab uh, region regarding of this uh, flow of openness. So uh, my comments is that uh, what are the benefits of talking about open science with the existence of closed mind? What are the benefits of talking about open data with uh, the existence of shut collaboration? What is the benefit of open data with the null teamwork? So thank you, Dr. Sharif, about this. And I need you just to give more elaboration about the open-minded for the researcher, academics, before just giving more push for the open data, open science. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Abdullah. He's my colleague in the same department, Cairo University. I feel proud when I have my colleague asking me a question. Uh, you have to insist, you have to believe. I came here just to say that we need to give our librarians the opportunity to work, open accessibility, open research, open information not only just write papers and say, okay, please follow. You have to believe that this is a message and you are ready for it. Librarians are the hub for all open science and open research initiatives all over the world. Thank you, Professor Abdul. Any other questions here? Yeah. Professor Isa Hilal University again. Thanks uh, all, for all panelists. Dr. Sharif, uh, by the way, you said the librarian have to lead the open access movement. What about the conflict in the practices in the, our higher supreme of uh, higher education? Uh, the 
The university library has collected the thesis and the dissertations. In your presentation, you recommend to make dissertation and the thesis uh, available for all. They, I, I think, from five years ago, collect collecting uh, our dissertation, and until now, they just uh, make it available just as abstract. Where is the librarian? In the other side, it could be from above. We have the we 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 don't have the power to enforce the institution to make it available. They keep telling us about barriers, about licensing. There is a, a lot of dissertation there out of date. Who, who can care about it? This dissertation could be a tool for, uh, as a solution for the plagiarism we talk about uh, in, in the morning. In another side, it could be make a tool available for the journal and everyone use it. And there is a lot of journal available now on the platform. This is a conflict in practices in the same institution. What about that? Who wants to answer this one first? Uh, give it to al -Walim. It's, it's, a, something. it's a free for all. Uh, Everyone gets to say the answer. Professor, professor Ahmad Saleh, he's a professor in Alaiba Information Science in Hilwan University, and he's the vice uh, president for AFLI, Arab Federation for Library and Information. We need a legislation or something like uh, policy, Arab policy for open science. I suggest this for AFLI. This is conference, okay. uh, open science, open, open access guidelines. Inshallah. Arabic, Arabic. Inshallah. Inshallah. Uh, uh, what about the repository for electronic thesis and dissertation supervised by the higher supreme for universities is in their way to open it for plagiarism check for Arabic and English, both. And full text. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Like to, <laughs> maybe, 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 maybe I can add something. Uh, I mean, so we've been talking about an Arabic policy, an Arab region policy. Um, that's difficult maybe to, to achieve, even if as a template, uh, for it to be accepted for every other country, if it's quite difficult. I mean, even if as a family you're going out for dinner, you can't agree on which restaurant to get food from or what to deliver to home. So, but you have the principle of doing, getting food, so are we getting open science? But I think we need to think also about doing on policies on an institution level, not even on a country level. Um, I mean, there's no one approach, but having and, and kind of putting our goal is to have a regional approach might might be take might take a lot of time and difficult to achieve. Thank you. Um, any other questions? And do you remember we've also got uh, uh, Mr. Raid on the online as well. Any other questions? We've got quite a lot of time for questions. If anyone has any. World Cup tickets are still on sale. So. Um, oh, we've got a comment online, but it's not really. Um, just say the Arab citation index is great work. Keep up the good work. A nice, not really a question though. Um, any other questions? Anyone? Well, in that case, oh, you have a question. Yeah, yeah. can I ask a question to our fellow speaker? Um, I mean, you've mentioned about business models and you don't agree about the open access business models. Of course, there are different business models also within for, for gold open access. Um, I was wondering what do you think would be a good business model rather than, let's say, uh, APC uh, based? Uh, thank you, Alvarit, for this interesting question. So let's let's look at the publishing process. It's funded typically by taxpayers' money or by some private foundation. The intellectual property comes from the researchers. The work is done from it's done by the researchers, the bulk of the work. And for setting up a website, a company like Springer Verlag actually is in the business of profiting from all of this. There's something wrong with that. And you're not really adding the kind of value that you are beyond providing your brand name. 
you're not really adding much in terms of value. The question that, that, that we have to ask ourselves is, okay, if we are really going to be in a culture of openness, then that should not be really a, a profit seeking operation. Now, how could you actually be doing this? Well, it could be actually funded by the same sources, like the publish the publication process, would be funded by the same sources that are paying for the research. In this particular case, you could actually think of in 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 the United States, the National Science Foundation, and Qatar would be the Qatar Foundation. Uh, every country has a certain authority that is actually directing the funding from the taxpayers' money. And there is no reason not to believe that this could be done by a nonprofit organization that is working for the public good, because this is what this is about. The, if the dissemination of knowledge is really for the public good. It is never was never meant to be a profit generation for a particular company. So it's it's valid. <laughs> so I think, yeah, if I come here. <laughs> so uh, the, the thing is, you know, like traditional publishing, and if you mentioned intellectual property, right? In traditional publishing, an, an author would uh, submit an article to a publisher. He or she would then sign off all their copyright to the publisher. So uh, at least with open access, they retain some of these rights. I agree with uh, the point about kind of where the money is coming from. That's really important. But publishers are still making money anyways. So even if in non-traditional kind of non-open non access publishing, they're still getting a lot. Well, you want to Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Raid wants to chime in. Okay. Um, we just, uh, is the audio working for, for our uh, online speaker? Uh, sure hello, sure. everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, please do answer your question. Oh. Ask your question, sir. Well, uh, if you allow me, uh, I will add uh, something. Uh, first of all, uh, um, many thanks for uh, the team who organized this this important forum, and many thanks to my colleagues who, with the, the, the distinguished uh, and valuable uh, presentations as well. And uh, as well, I am unfortunate uh, to be among uh, you today. But I have to add something when talking about the Buddhists. I guess there is something to be done when it comes to to Buddhists awareness first, and then Buddhists. Maybe since this event is conducting in cooperation with UNESCO, maybe UNESCO can play a significant role in in initiating Buddhists at regional level, at country level, where we can have a a kind of national uh, roadmaps for, for open science in, in general, and then go, go, go toward the institutions, uh, the policies as well. Uh, when it's come uh, to the debate always ab about uh, open access and publishing, and and, and actually it's, it's a debate. Uh, either you pay for subscription and, and uh, researchers and author uh, need to wait very long time to get their, their research published, and either to go to the open access way where they have to, to, to pay fees or the institution itself will pay the fees. Uh, I think it's very important to, to start thinking seriously about, about research assessment, over research assessment. I, I guess San, San Francisco declaration, the, 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 the declaration uh, may be a good, good start point in, in, the, in the region, the Arabic region to start a real open open uh, uh, and free assessment of research to, to avoid any 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 um, debate or any any uh, misuse of, of uh, author need and institution needs to, to get their work published in in, in um, maybe not related uh, journals or, or or publisher thank you thank you very much research assessment is always a a uh, stressful topic. I noticed, um, oh, yes, sorry, you have one more answer. Yes, one more answer. And then uh, Dr. Batul. I need to answer. I need to answer his question. So he said that the publishers would need to make money anyway. 
uh, go back to the history. The, when the publishers started, they were actually preparing the camera ready copy. They were doing a lot of editing. They were actually printing the journals. They were actually shipping the journals to people. There were costs involved in all of this. It was legitimate for them in return for their efforts to really make money. Today, you, pub you submit a paper. There is no camera proof anything. You are required to do the typesetting as, as, as the researcher. You are doing all the work. All they do is they put your paper on a website. In return for this, you give them your copyright. You give them uh, $2,000 on average. Uh, there's something wrong with that. I'm sorry. I would say you don't give them your copyright and pay. It's an either or if they're legitimate. <laughs> formula is that in traditional publishing libraries still have to come up with a lot of money to pay the subscription fees so whether the library is paying or an individual somebody has to pay the publisher and i think a solution again i mean not to have to choose between the money has to be somehow organized on an institution level so that there's no double payment from the library or the author but I don't, I mean, I'll, I'll agree to disagree. <laughs> the gentleman here is, is, is a proponent of the capitalist model, while I am a communist. And I'm an open access publisher and occasionally like Travis Allery. <laughs> On that note, I just want to hear what, uh, there's Dr. Batul first and then Mrs. Rabab. Uh, uh, thank you for a very interesting discussion and panel. Uh, my question is a bit technical to Dr. Raj. Um, so you mentioned collaboration with La Referencia, which is a network, federated network in Latin America. And I think there is a lot to learn, actually, from the policies and infrastructure that have been implemented in Latin America with very, very limited resources. Um, their infrastructure is built in supporting Latin script, whereas Arabic is non-Latin script and is right to love language. So, uh, I was wondering if you got anything to share, like what approach you've taken to tackle that issue. Thank you. Uh, I think it was a question for, for Ray first. Yeah, yeah, yes, can I answer the question? So we can hear you, do, do speak, uh, Mr. Ray. Yes, yes, uh, thank you for uh, your question. Y yes, the collaboration with the Lara France has started actually maybe 18 months ago. La Referencia is a kind of federated search for all Latin America countries. They have uh, 10, no, uh, 10 nodes in different uh, Latin American countries where they do harvesting of open access content in, in each country. And then the upper layer, which harvest from the, the these uh, 10 nodes and make it available uh, for public. Uh, with with um, uh, standardization, with uh, uh, ready and compatible with open air uh, standards. Uh, uh, so uh, we thought to utilize the, the, their tool. We had uh, a kind of pilot uh, project where we have access to their um, uh, setup infrastructure. We made um, uh, several tests for different, uh, several repositories in, in the Arabic region. And the results were so promising. Maybe there is a need to qualify the repository. Uh, maybe uh, many of the repositories in the Arabic region are made uh, to the default setup with less of required metadata with less standards. I guess by, by working on, on, on these repositories, we, we, we can um, uh, initiate a kind of uh, templates of, of, of setup that can be applied to, to most of the open um, access repositories in the Arabic region. Asrin has uh, recently signed an agreement with La Referencia. Uh, uh, through this agreement, uh, th there will be an installation of Asrin uh, uh, copy of the, the setup with efforts from ASRIN team to do a kind of internationalization. Uh, the setup is already supporting uh, uh, the English uh, 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 interface, and we are aiming to have an Arabic interface. And hopefully, very soon, by the end of this year, hopefully at the beginning of the coming year, we'll have a, a, a core of harvesting tool 
that will will facilitate access to open access content in the Arabic region. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we have a question from Mrs. Rabab, I believe. There's a microphone just there. Oh, perfect. Um, well, it's um, it's uh, one comment for to Dr. Sharif uh, about road. Um, road, road. Yeah. We are we are absent as your present uh, as your presentation has shown. Uh, but um, uh, registration in road does not need any evaluation. It is just a technical check on the ISSN network. So it's um, it it should not it should be a scientific open access journal. That's it. Thank you. So it's um, I think it's something technical. We have to discuss it with ISSN, of course. Please, thank you. Um, as for the um, my my, it's just also a comment on the APC. Um, um, APC exaggeration for 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 uh, for amount of money which is 2000 and something if the author if the uh, the yeah sure okay sorry <laughs> the, the question the question is the 2000 the the the, the publisher who took 2000 is doing everything because we through the through the academy of scientific research and any many other initiatives we worked on it and um, I don't think that there is an author would go for something that he will make an effort again um, uh, to do something like copy editing or um, a type setting or something. Uh, um, what I, we need, what we need, what I, I'm, I'm just asking for is, don't you see that authors themselves are a pushing part because authors are paying? Are, sorry, authors are? Are paying. Well, uh, the authors are paying because uh, they do not have a choice right now. The, I am talking to you about the last paper I, I, I published. Um, the publisher came back to me and said, here are the instructions for the camera ready copy. Uh, please follow them. And then I submitted it, heard no nothing. And then I, I discovered an error just before the paper went actually for, uh, for the issue. And I, I I sent a note to the to the uh, to the to the publisher, and they said, "Oh, okay. Well, thank you very much for discovering the error." And it turns out when I asked, they actually let go of all of their editors, the people who used to do the typesetting. They just let them go, and they count on the on me and you and all the people who are publishing to do all the typesetting. It, it is just that the way it is. Now, you may be lucky, you may actually be dealing with a better journal that is still actually doing an honest job at doing that. And by the way, the journal that I'm uh, that I'm talking to you about is the premier journal in computer science, number one, communications of the ACM, okay? It doesn't get any better than that. So uh, even there, you will see, and this, and even the ACM is a community-based organization. And even there, the, the, the quest for making money is just paramount. It's, it's, it, it, it is really a, a situation where I think the model, I mean, we are trying to advance the model from the traditional uh, journal paper-based publications, and we're coming up with open science, and we're coming up with open access, but we are still beholding to the old, in mo the, the old models where the publishers was assuming this extremely important role here. If you really look at the life cycle today in terms of the amount of effort that goes into any paper, the publisher does almost like a small epsilon into the entire process. And on top of that, they, I mean, I'm giving you 2000. There are, there are papers in the biology sure, field, 5,000, 4, 5,000, okay? And then you go and you find that these are companies that are trading on the stock market and they are really, look at their profit margin, increasing year after year after year. And what are they doing for that? Nothing. I mean, it, uh, it, it's, it's just crazy I, in my opinion. I'm just, I'm, I'm just commenting on that because I'm not a researcher. I'm not publishing. I'm working on the publishing. So that's, uh, that's uh, the other way around. If we are, uh, you're speaking from the researcher point of view. I'm speaking from the administration point of view. That's as this are the case. I, I know, of course. Can I, can I just add one more thing? Sorry. I mean, I think this discussion about APCs can take a long time. And we're too focused on the 2000. That's average, by the way. So 2000, there's like 3000, 4000. And you would think that over time, with more competition and et cetera, um, following economic rules, that the price will go down. It doesn't, it just keeps going up. Uh, but 
Uh, not all open access journals require an APC. Some publish for without cost. Uh, if you look at the DOAJ, you would find out, for example, I think I'm very, I'm, should, I'm very supportive of the DOAJ today, so I'm going to seven times today. But if you check out the DOAJ, you can find journals that don't cost anything. So to reduce the, the conversation, or at least the argument that APC is ba as bad with all due respect, is not fair to the business business model. There are a lot of different ways that can it can be done. And yes, there are some journals that are predatory in nature that might take advantage and they exist, but there's still a lot of good out there. And so you don't actually need to pay in certain cases. So no. <laughs> the only thing is that yes, there are there are journals out there that are actually relying on third party funding and they do not really charge you an APC. Uh, I very much respect these publishers. However, I have to say that they are uh, in the minority. And it would be great if all uh, publishers actually move into that model, but that's not what I see right now. But it's happening, Doctor, uh, because EKB is supporting about 35%, 35 journals with Springer. You can publish on them free for of charge. And the uh, Academy of Scientific Research is, is, is supporting about um, more than it was a 40, and now it's um, uh, because of the margins, it, it decreased. So I think in Egypt, and this is a quest, uh, and this is for Dr. Um, El Walid, um, uh, also it was, there is, the, it's not only the author should pay, institutions are paying because it's not only libraries or national libraries, it's institutions just like what we are supporting since two, uh, 2010 in, at the academy, is that we are paying for journals to be published with Elsevier, with Medno, with Lepincott. And then it is um, um, they have to deal with their authors. Uh, the other EKB is publishing with Springer now, and uh, they are supporting this, and you, have, you can publish free of charge. So it's not, there are many of these efforts are, are, are done already. Not sure if that was a particular question, but does anyone else have any <laughs> questions? Okay, wow, many questions. Um... Uh, I'm Abdullah Assad from IOP Publishing, uh, and I just want to start by thanking you all. And again, uh, I'd like to comment on uh, Professor Mortez's talk because I found it very insightful. Yet, uh, on the other hand, we need to clearly differentiate between non-for-profit society publishers, for instance, and on the other hand, the commercial publishers, which you've kindly highlighted that they are listed in uh, stock exchanges. Uh, they only care about the profit margins. And unfortunately, in some cases, it's correct. But on the other hand, uh, let's say for non-for-profit society publishers, we do not retain any profits, meaning any profits that we generate throughout the proceeds of our subscriptions, uh, open access agreements, it has to go back to the society, to empowering researchers. For instance, we invest heavily, heavily in nurturing the newer generations of peer reviewers. We have a, a, a free uh, a hub online completely for free. It's uh, free for all researchers on, uh, to teach them on how to be excellent reviewers. So you do not fall in, in the case where we found the number of papers that are being published are increasing massively year on year, whereas the number of uh, uh, experience pool of reviewers doesn't really uh, catch up with that increase, meaning it creates some sort of low quality publications uh, being published and it's affecting, of course, the uh, international audience. On the other hand, we also invest heavily, let's say, in uh, supporting the early career researchers. So for instance, and I speak uh, of this fact, uh, we once came across a PhD student who wanted to publish in one of the, uh, uh, let's say, uh, Q1 or uh, uh, top notch uh, journal in, in the research area. Unfortunately, they weren't really familiar with the uh, uh, fact or the uh, uh, one uh, important rule, you cannot submit your manuscript to simultaneous or multiple journals at the same time. And unfortunately, they did that because uh, uh, not being ill intended, but they wanted to save time, they wanted to impress their uh, professor. On the other hand, it caused them to be blacklisted, unfortunately, because as you all know, that we all run uh, all the manuscripts by anti-plagiarism software. So we definitely detected it being submitted at different journals at the same time. So it was completely rejected. We invest heavily in these so resources. Can I just ask, because there's a lot of people waiting to ask yeah, questions. I'm, I'm sorry about that. I, I tried to wrap it up. I, I just, 
the, the last point, Professor Mortez, which I uh, would like to highlight is that the majority of our uh, expenses, it goes against the workflows. So we got you. I just one word, please make sure that people know and publicize your model so that you can set an example for others. Thank you very much, sir. We'll definitely do. And thanks oh, again thanks. for your time. Sorry, <laughs> uh, so the next question, I think it was the lady in the, the red hat scarf had a question. Okay, good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Dr. Amani Saeed, uh, prof professor at Helwan University. I just wanted to ask, uh, first, uh, thanks for Dr. Sharif Shaheen, uh, Dr. Al Walid, uh, Dr. Mu'taz. My question is for Dr. Mu'taz. I just wanted to ask, um, uh, if uh, the open access journals or open access movement uh, come up to uh, solve or a possible solution uh, for uh, serials or journals uh, publishing a crisis. It will publish rapidly, a peer review, but uh, as you said uh, in your uh, presentation, it turned to uh, a crisis because it's become a model, a business model. Uh, uh, one of our journal in library and information science, which is health informatics, it's $2,000 to publish an article in this issue. So are we, what are we doing? We will stay and say, uh, uh, or uh, just leave the publisher to do what he wants. Uh, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 dollars for one article for researchers, especially in Arab countries. Not all publish, uh, not all researchers in the Arab countries can afford this cost. Uh, we have to do something. Uh, universities, uh, research bodies in uh, Arab countries have to do something. I, I agree with you. The whole idea here is that we need to really start this dialogue especially here in the Middle East when we are really very sensitive to this notion of EPC. Uh, the gentleman in the back, I am sorry I didn't catch his name, provided a very interesting model for a publisher who is actually working as a nonprofit. Maybe you need to listen to more to this. Uh, there was somebody pointed here that there is another publisher who is also not really charging any APCs. We need to start thinking seriously about uh, working with publishers of this kind, at the same time making sure that the peer review remains at the highest levels so that we don't really compromise the quality because there is a lot of, of low cost publishers, so to speak, who are really not doing anything in terms of peer review and actually publishing there is even worse than having to pay for the money. So work, I mean, we need, we need the dialogue and, yes. we need, and we need to really look at these models. We need to innovate in the, in the models of publishers. It doesn't make any sense to adopt the models of, of, of the time when we were doing things with paper and continue to do this right now. So I, I applaud the innovation in the back. I, I don't know much about the detail, but I'd like to really hear some more, but we need to really evolve the publishing process. Uh, I think we still need a dialogue with uh, commercial publishers. The problem is the dialogue with commercial publishers. Thank you. One more question. Oh, no, sorry. I'd like two more questions. Uh, hi, this is Nada Musaik. I just wanted to add one more element to, to this conversation. It's also the role of the universities who are putting the promotion and tenure uh, uh, policies to make sure that it's based on quality rather than quantity. It's not just how many paper you publish, it's the quality, the quality of the journal. And I think this is a very important aspect to consider in this conversation. Thank you. And then gentlemen in the gray suit, that's our final question. Thank you. Uh, this is Munir Abu Bakr from Zaid University in Dubai. Uh, I want to thank uh, all the three presenters about their uh, very informative, interesting uh, presentations. This is not a question. It's, you can consider it as an announcement. It's a bit related to Dr. Sharif's presentation uh, about institution repositories in the Arab countries. Uh, I'm glad to, to tell you that Zaid University, uh, since a year, uh, it's, it's been a year for now, that we have an institutional, institutional repository for Zaid University publications for all the faculty. Thousand articles for, for these are uh, faculty publications that are harvested from Scopus and from Web of Science. They're open for all and free of charge. 
So I, I encourage everyone to go to the Zaid University website. It's called ZU Scholar. It's a free, you can have it. And uh, out of just, uh, uh, you know, having a look, we have around three, you know, like 300, 500 downloads per day from all over the world. Just, just for your uh, information and please try and make use of it. Thank you. I think that's a lovely note to finish on because we're all being collaborative and sharing ideas and, and open open materials. So on that note, I hope you'll all join me in uh, thanking a really excellent panel today, Dr. Ode Online and the three of you here. Thank you. It's been very, very good. Thank you.